Hi, I'm Nadja Siegelman, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the 2021 Book Festival for a conversation with Leonie Ross from Suleiman Adonia. Suleiman Adonia's Silence is My Mother's Tongue follows two siblings in a refugee camp who resist social expectations. Saba mourns the future she lost when she was forced to abandon school, while her brother Hagos is scorned for his inability to speak. Suleiman beautifully captures the textures and rhythms of the camp and its inhabitants in their full humanity. Leonie Ross's Puppy Show takes, am I pronouncing that correctly, Leonie? Puppy, Puppy Show? Show? Puppy Show. Yes. Puppy Show also takes place in a world set apart, this one in a magical fictional island of Puppy Show. Here, everyone is born with a cores, a special magic unique to them, be it the ability to spot a lie, know the exact age of death, heal, or simply move very fast. It's a central meditation on desire and addiction and a critique of the legacies of corruption and colonialism. And before we begin, I want to let you know that both of these beautiful books by these authors can be purchased in the link below. Um, so I want to start by asking, um, your books are about a great many things other than sex. And I'm curious if you were surprised to find yourself on this panel, is sex and sexuality an inherent and central element that you're th thinking of as you write? Or is it one that er enters the narrative more incidentally? Um, I think I'm not surprised. Um, Suleiman, I've jumped in. Um, I think I'm not surprised because a bit in the UK, for those who do know me, I'm kind of known as the sex writer, which is um, yet another um, example of the fact that a little sex goes a long way. Maybe 25% of what I write is about human sexuality, but it, it, you know, like in a collection of short stories, for example, three of the stories were erotic and like 20 of the others weren't, but people still, I think if you write, particularly as a woman, um, write uh, in a forthright manner about sexuality, it gets lots of attention. So no, I'm not, I'm not surprised to be here. I don't think that Poppy Show is a particularly sexual book, and yet the reviews say that it is tremendously sensory and sensual and full of sex. And actually, <laughs> something occurred to me at a point I remember telling someone about a year ago when I was discussing the novel with them that, you know, there's not very much sex in it this time. There's one sex scene. And she went, oh, really? And then I went back and I counted and I realized actually there are about six. And then I had to have a conversation with myself about why did I miss out five of my own sex scenes? And I think what's happening is that much as you've just said, I think discussing sexuality is something that comes comes naturally to me. I don't think, I can't think of any other way to say it. It feels organic to mention in all kinds of different ways, not only to have sexual scenes, but also for people to consider their own sexualities, to consider their sensory bodies. This is something that I've, I've been doing for a long time and feels very natural to me as a writer and as a person. So, so, so no, it's not strange for me to be here on this panel. Um. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, no, it isn't. I wouldn't say it is. Um, but actually, it's also a question of what we mean by sex, because I think partly for me, uh, um, through um, when I was writing this book, the 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 question of sex, the I, you know, what it means, actually was one of the main. Um, were the main theme actually behind, even though it is not explicitly mentioned in the book, uh, is something that really was with me from the beginning to the end, which took about 10 years. But the other thing that I'm not surprised about, it's basically the gas painting was the inspiration behind this book. So even if sex isn't present in every single page, scene after scene, it was, you know, nudity was what inspired this book from the beginning. Uh, and, you know, the gas painting of a, a woman taking a bath was the thing that inspired this book. And the details of the body was what inspired this book. The intimacy, the scent of the body and, the, you know, uh, it, yeah. So, yeah, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm really happy to be, to be having that conversation, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, well, as, as you both sort of used, you both talked about how how sex is one aspect of sensuality. Leonie and Puppy Show 
food and drugs are also very central and sensual pleasures. Suleiman, in your narrative, there are few sensual pleasures to be had outside of the body for your characters. And I wonder how erotic desire relates to, intertwines with, and also differs from our other desires in your mind. I mean, that's a big old question. Um, I mean, I think, as we know, desires get mixed up with all kinds of other things. They become intertwined with our childhoods. We become concerned about how we seem to other people. We, you know, whether it's sex or, or drugs or food or other desires that we have to be loved and so on, these things are both personal and performative as well. So we're having a relationship with our own selves and we're also having a relationship with other people and how we think we're seen. Um, so I, I don't know that I necessarily see connections that, that occur to me right now, but I, I do think it's interesting to consider characters who are, of course, moved, motivated strongly. And so whether it is that it's a hunger for food or whether it is in, in, in Poppy Show, one of our characters is addicted, he's addicted to hallucinogenic moths um, and it's a bit like heroin. And so as a, as a former, well, I suppose, I think, I think you're always an addict in that you're always thinking about this. You're always having a relationship with your own desire for, for something. So I think it, you know, what I think is interesting, our relationship with the desire. We have all the desires. What is our relationship with the desire? And I tend to create characters that are having a difficult time with the desire. So whether it is that they are trying to, um, to, to work their way through how they use their bodies or what their bodies look like or who they share their bodies with, or um, in some cases, in, in other books, not so much this one, um, when, when bodily autonomy is taken away from them. It's all to do with what relationship do we have with our desires? Are they, are they healthy? How do we navigate them? How do we... Um, I suppose, live a real authentic life. And by that, I don't mean perfection. I mean, actually, how do we have a relationship with the imperfections that our, our desires illustrate, I suppose? Um, for me, that is a, a very, very interesting question. Actually, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot lately is about not necessarily the act of self itself, but um, the kind of um, desire that is we kind of garner from different elements so that actually surround us or is even that exists we you know um within our medium um i'm thinking here about hagos for example uh the way for example he makes his own perfume his own uh body cream the way he kind of um you know, uh, the way he interacts with his body, the way he elevates his body, this supposedly masculine male body into something that is quite feminine, uh, into something that, you know, that is something else that means something special, unique only to him. And I'm thinking about the painter, uh, Leonardo Fini, the Argentinian painter, in a way she, um, when I was writing this book, I would I studied her a lot, and I studied, um, you know, the way, for example, she um, she was I think one of the first Western women where she did um, uh, uh, she painted a, um, a, a male nude, and it was this idea of elevating the male from being the kind of always behind the camera to actually being or behind you know to being the central of a painting, you know. So to me, for a man to occupy that kind of um, the center of, of this idea of what it means to be sensual, sexual, I think that was very, very important. And I think that kind of inspired the whole notion of sexuality and also desires what it means beyond the whole uh, sexual acts. Um, yeah. And that sounds really interesting, Soleiman, that you're emphasizing, at least in that, in, in that context, the female gaze on the man rather than mm -hmm. what we're used to, which is so often the other way around, especially in the creation of art. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, that was really important. Uh, and again, I've kind of studied a lot of painters and artists and photographers like uh, Francisco Woodman. I've, am I pronouncing her name correctly? Um, 
she's also one of those people who showed me actually to be brave in a way she, her body was in in constant negotiation with her surrounding in, in constant conversation with her surrounding so in a way as a man i'm kind of always interested in how photographers or artists or painters kind of have that kind of an idea of what, of what a male body is um, and with Leonor, uh, I think what I really love about her is that she gave the man this kind of femininity uh, and this kind of aspect of, um, of moment to kind of be more than one thing, to be more a kind of representation of just a masculine entity and to occupy other possible spaces as well. That was one thing that I really loved in both of your work was that you use language in such expansive ways that the body is so much more than just a body. It's often described, Leonie, in your work with words that have to do with plants and nature and Suleiman in your work often with, with, um, with the earth, with maps, with rivers, with, um, and I, I'm curious about sort of, of, the, of that expansiveness of how the body becomes more than the body. I think the body is always more than the body because we because we bring value to it as a human community, you know. So we 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 judge bodies. We come to conclusions about people's characters and hearts as a result of the first couple of seconds of seeing their bodies, whether it's their face or their larger form. Um, I mean, I think also at its best, I think that the body should be, could be responding to the earth, responding to plants, responding to water, responding to the sky. I certainly know that my body reacts differently when I am outside, when I am in nature, when I am, you know, when I am, I'm, I'm able to, to, to access different layers of sensory and sensual input when I'm in the air, you know, when I'm in water or when I'm in heat or cold, whatever it is, because I'm, I suppose, and I think we all do that if we can kind of be quiet for a moment, you know, I think we become conscious, I mean, I don't want to sound pretentious, but we become conscious not only of our own bodies, but how we are also kind of part of, of everything else, um, and that we are tiny and that actually the body is small and fragile and, you know, can fall at any moment, but is also tremendously powerful and, and part of, of, of the rest of, of what is here, you know. So I, I think that I think that the way that bodies commune with with that that is outside them is tremendously complicated and we can make it very small. And we have made it very small in a way that actually makes me angrier and angrier, particularly of women, but not only of women. The smallness is we've become obsessed with our bodies in the context of what they look like. And it was ever thus, yes, but it feels to me like it's gotten even bigger, particularly for women, that the emphasis is so much on the gaze upon us in terms of, I mean, it's more important what we look like than how we smell or how we sound or, you know, there are, there are different you know, there are different senses, and yet there's this constant emphasis and, and, and comparison to, um, to a, a kind of social ideal, um, certainly in the West anyway. And so I, th I think that's problematic, and that takes away from what I think could be a more expansive use of our bodies as tools in this world, and also as part of a kind of macrocosm, which I think makes me sound a bit woo and a bit a bit hippie like but yet I still think is a position that makes sense when we're still and we actually feel our bodies outside of others looking at us but as part of you know as part of the earth and yes now I have completely my hippie credentials have just blown up. <laughs> <laughs> it, no it was beautiful listening to you <laughs> no I mean um um, to be honest, I'm not really sure what comes first, the, the, or how can I say, this kind of conversation that happens between the body and nature, uh, does it come about because the body is sensitive and so absorb the nature's language, or is the other way around? Um, for me, anyway, when I started working with this book, uh, you know, with... Um, 
refugees who fled uh, Eritrea uh, and found themselves in this kind of wilderness, a place of scarcity, I think the body becomes central. I think it becomes one of the, uh, the kind of the source of wealth uh, that is present 24 hours. That is something that you can't miss. You know, if you might not have a car anymore, you might not have a job, you might not have a bicycle, but you have your body, you know? And so naturally, uh, because it is so central, then you start noticing that kind of relationships with nature, the way it changes, you know? So it becomes all about the details, how even, you know, um, the smallest, the tiniest t detail that happens to your body, suddenly you notice it because that's the only thing you have. And I think then uh, even the impact of nature, when an aunt is, for example, crawling on his thighs or, you know, and then that becomes also some kind of form of a language, you know, or a, a, a wild flower and you go in, you know, you're in a forest, you go in a bush or something touches your skin, then you become alive to that. So there's a certain, uh, I think it's a form of free living with nature and finding nature again. And, and then there are moments obviously where the, that language is heightened and it becomes sensual again. And then we go into that world where we're talking about sensitivity, vulnerability, and sensuality as well. I find it really funny that I find it really funny that because we know that sexuality is only part of the equation, that this quickly becomes a conversation about body rather than sexuality in particular, because it's it, it's just part of of the our experiences with bodies. Which actually leads to another question that I had. I feel like um, Suleiman, your narrative illustrates so beautifully how sex can both be a way to restore our humanity to us and also to remove it from us. There are moments of real sexual violence in your book. Um, and sex is about so much more than desire in both your books. It's depicted as, as something unerotic, as something that can be violent or transactional or something that can be used in exchange for, used as a, as a means towards agency. And I'm curious to talk about that as well, about all of the, all of the sort of ways in which sex is represented in your books, but also is, exists in the world as, as something that, that is simply beyond the erotic. Can I go first? <laughs> um, I think for me, I think yeah, you put it beautifully. I think um, it isn't necessarily one thing. I mean, Saba and Hagos were introduced to sex when they were young through violence and rape. Um, and then it becomes about how do you actually learn to give sex um, another formula, another possibility that you kind of, um, uh, that kind of you welcome it into your life uh, with your own hand. And then you kind of, um, you're developing a new idea of sex that is defined by you, not by the other, you know? Um, and, and for example, uh, when Saba comes to the refugee camp, for example, on the first night she masturbates, you know, you know, refugee camp is a place where it's a freshly built refugee camp. So it's, uh, it smells of dung, you know, and, um, and, you know, the first thing she does is when she masturbates and then all she, uh, uh, you know, the, the, her own sense kind of heightens and it becomes the source that kind of links her uh, uh, to this heart, to this um, new environment. And in a way, and I think that's a very way of using power. You're, you know, you're using the power of your own body to occupy, to, to say that I am here, you know? And, and I think in the same way, I think um, for Saba and Hagar, sex becomes a way to actually, uh, yeah, um, speak out and loud and be proud of who they are and also as a way to say uh this is us that's what sex means to us uh and yeah it goes parallel to this uh the violence um uh, that you mentioned i think certainly for one of my primary characters xavier who is who is our moth addict 
I think his his experience of sexuality has been affected by all kinds of externals and is not just, as you say, about sex, but but about more as well. Um, because I was interested to look at almost gently what coercion is for, for a man. And so he, if you really look through the book, his first sexual experiences was kind of with his master teacher. He is a chef and he was taught how to be a chef by a master chef. Uh, who was a woman and who was older than him and who seduced him. And um, I was really interested to, to explore kind of gently that space of a young man who strictly was 18, so supposedly legal, um, but, you know, very young and wanting to please. And it's very clear where the power lies within the dynamic. Um, he says very clearly, you know, he, that he finds her attractive. He wants to, to have sex with her this master teacher who is coming on to him, but at the same time, he recognizes that he doesn't really have a choice or he feels like he doesn't have a choice. And part of that is the circumstances of, of this person coming on to him, but partially is social as well. He feels like men around him would laugh at him. Why wouldn't he have sex with this powerful, beautiful woman who's older than him, who's giving it up? And so I kind of wanted to, and so set when, when within this book they have sex again later, when they are much older, it is both a kind of putting, it's putting him back into a terrible space in which he's reminded of the coercion again, but can pull himself back out of it. What he's wanted, and he's also ended up with the wrong wife. So he's kind of got this pattern of making love with or having sex with people he doesn't quite want to be with but are kind of good enough or he wants to please them and so in some ways this book is about him moving his way back to Anis who is really the woman who he wanted to not only make love with but to to be with um, and that they have their their opportunity finally so I think that I mean, I hesitate to even talk about coercive sex as sex. I mean, you know, my my whole spirit, because I, I think that sexuality is such a powerful and positive and gorgeous kind of affirmation of life when done right. I just, I, you know, the, the tendency is to go, the coercion is not sex. That's not sex. That's coercive sex or that's rape or that's power or that's other things. But but you can get bogged down in language. Of course, we're writers, so we get bogged down in language. Um, I think what I think is that sex, sexuality is complicated. And it. I think it also takes, I love that your character is masturbating because it feels to me like, particularly for women, but for all of us, masturbation is this wonderful powerful experience that really is gorgeously selfish and only for us and is like maybe it's the epitome of of what is sexual because it is it, it's all about us and it's about us getting to know ourselves and express ourselves with authenticity so i love that your your female character is masturbating that's great i mean <laughs> it's funny you say that because i i um I just wrote an essay uh, called The Art of Making Love to Yourself. And I think, um, I think I was really interested in elevating this idea of making love to yourself to the same level that we supposedly make love to other people, you know? And it took me a long time to place it, actually, but I finally did. <laughs> oh, I love, I love that. I love that because, yes, you're right. There's this idea that masturbation is the thing you do until you get a partner or the thing you do yourself quickly and it's not really important. Um, or, of course, for both men and women, that it's a shameful thing to do or a selfish thing to do. And I think it's a fabulous thing to do because apart from anything else, it's one of the ways you learn how to experience your own pleasure. And of course, then you can potentially, if you wish to communicate that to other people, which is not so easy. There are plenty of people, because I mean, we know about the orgasm gap for women, right? That so many women do physical things for themselves when masturbating, that they don't ask for or get done to them or with them during sex. During sex. So one is more guaranteed to, to, to end up with orgasm and the other isn't, but one's called masturbation and one's called sex it's just it's, it's yeah. ridiculous yeah Absolutely. <laughs> it's ridiculous. 
Leone, I wonder if we can transition from here into um, a scene in your book that you are going to read for us um, that is very much about someone examining their own sex. Um, but, and if you maybe want to provide a bit of context of what has brought us. Sure. To yes, I shall, I shall. Okay, so um, I'm probably reading from the last third of the novel. And at this point earlier in the novel, something strange and challenging has happened to all of the adult women in this island, this fictional island called Poppy Show. Their vulvas have fallen away from their bodies. Um, so our female protagonist, Anise, keeps her vulva in her pocket until page 317, which is when I'm going to read uh, where I'm going to read from. Um, and when she finally examines it um, on page 317, she's really put this off so long because she's had actually in her life several really painful, tragic stillbirths. And so she's really afraid of what she might see when she examines her own body carefully. So this is Anise having a look. She's literally holding her vulva in her hand. Her vulva was surprisingly hot to the touch and damp, like a piece of aromatic sod. She pressed lightly around the outer, outer labia and above the pubic mound, checking for tears or damage. It was strange to touch a piece of her body so intimately, yet feel nothing at all. She could trace pubic bones through the skin. They met just there, part of the hip girdle. She moved her hips carefully. The painlessness was so odd, given that bones were broken. Labia parted as she probed, giving her a pleasurable shock at the colour of her insides. Red or pink, she couldn't decide. Below that, her anus, a twinkling brown-pink thing itself. She drew back, amused at her own reservations, then leaned forward again. It was just part of a body. She smoothed the curly dark hair trickling down and around the aperture, letting her embarrassment die away. She smelled fine, just fine. She took a deep breath and used the first two fingers of both hands to part the outer lip so she could study the colour more closely. The hood of her plump clitoris peeled back with the movement an infinitesimal motion that made her jump. She bent closer, fascinated. A few years before she died, her friend Ingrid said people in Foreign had finally worked out that the clitoris was subterranean. Anise rubbed her finger just above the hood, feeling for the rubbery, movable rod under the skin. It reminded her of chicken cartilage the shaft connected to the bone by a suspensory ligament. Our Obia women have known for centuries, Ingrid said, imagine a wishbone and think of bulbs that fill with hot blood and muscle pulled tight across all of it, building tension and spasming like the stars. This is a gift only for women, only for pleasure. She imagined the entirety of the clitoris hot red flesh under the skin, thrumming and bubbling. She spread her labia further, both sets of lips protecting the vestibule, the delicate area between them. She liked that word for this part of the body, a chamber, a channel opening into another place, a waiting room, vestibule. It was also the name for the central cavity of the inner ear, and for the space between the cheeks and the teeth. There was a vestibule inside the heart. Beyond that, she could see a tiny winding road. She imagined herself grooved, her fingers sliding along soft patterns carved inside by the gods and time. She almost expected a croaking lizard to poke its head out of her vagina. Dare she peep? Fingertips dampen, she could see the remains of her hymen, tiny pieces of crinkled tissue, the corona. The wet walls wrapped around her careful exploring fingers, she giggled. She'd never considered how truly magical this flesh was, 
producing liquid if tickled. She pushed her fingers deeper. There was a small silver crackle as her magic exerted itself, inspired perhaps by her fingers' location. The more aroused you were, the further the mouth of the womb pulled back. Tell the man to go slow or you're not lying down with him. She charged money to teach women this, to teach them holy no's. Her daughters leaking through here and out of her. She swallowed spittle. Keep on, keep on, she thought. She couldn't see or feel any evidence of disease. No bruising or infection, nothing bent or broken, none of the noises or smells she could feel on other people, no cancer, no sexually transmitted disease, nothing airborne or feverish. There was nothing wrong with her nothing to tell her why they died. It was just so. Thanks. Beautiful, so beautiful. <laughs> Leone, I believe, I believe that here in this passage, I might be wrong, but I believe that here in this passage is where you first use words like vagina, vulva, labia, and that up until now in the book, even though this thing has happened to all these women on the island, which is that this part of their body has fallen off. It's referred to in the book as a pum pum. And pum, I wonder pum. about- pum. No, no, pum, no, no, I did right. Pum pum, yes. <laughs> pum pum. <laughs> Can you tell me about, about that language choice and how and why it shifts here? Um, I thought about this a lot, actually. I mean, the book does take on certain Jamaican words and plays around with Jamaican patwa, which is um, which is our dialect, uh, which is a version of English, but also combines old African words. And also I've pulled on some other patwas within the Caribbean, which also has a French root and in some cases a Spanish root. And some words I've just made up because I liked them and they were fun. And a lot of this book was written from a place of fun and, and joy and enthusiasm. Um, but pum pum is a wonderful word. Pum pum is a Jamaican word and it does mean vulva. And I kept trying to think, okay, so shall I call? Cause I know that the, the, this part of the body is gonna fall away from these women. So what shall I call it? Clearly vagina's wrong because vagina's internal. So your vagina can't actually drop off or out because it's actually a chamber, right? So that didn't work. And that was, you know, apart from anything else, biologically incorrect. Um, and then I thought, well, vulva, I don't like the word. And I mean, Suleiman, you will understand this. If we don't like the sound of a word, that's just the end of it, right? So that can't be much on the page. And then I thought, well, I'm playing around with the Caribbean patois anyway. Pum pum is a fabulous word with a wonderful rich history with all kinds of Jamaicans will, some Jamaicans will be appalled that I've used it. It is a naughty word. It's a bawdy word. It's our word. And I just thought it was perfect for the entirety. I mean, it does describe the entirety of the vulva. Um, I began to use the more technical words in this particular section because I was really doing a little a little mini class. Lots of people don't know how their vulvas work or how their vaginas work or how the clitorises work. Um, and so I, I kind of, there was a big old agenda here. So I did want to get the language correct, whatever that means. So hence that movement around. But largely, I'm just really, really happy that I've written a book that caused the New York Times to talk about pum pum. Um, <laughs> And then Suleiman, in your, in your book, um, there's a moment when Saba uh, reaches puberty in, in the refugee camp and, um, and she says, it was bewildering to her that a woman's passage into adulthood wasn't through her intellect, her character, but through her vagina. As far as she was concerned, she'd been a woman for some time now. And I wonder if you can both speak a little bit about this atomization into body parts, into sort of what this part of a woman's body means and how we examine and look at it to tell all sorts of things about whether or not this person is a woman to all of the sort of cultural significance around the idea of a hymen. And, and I'm just curious about how for both of you, this, this sort of reduction and atomization into body parts is something that appears in your work. Um, to be honest, Suleiman, you also 
Oh, sorry, not to interrupt. I, I meant to say you also you also write um, quite movingly and powerfully about circumcision in your book, which like did make me think about um, about the different ways in which these parts of a woman might fall off, both more fantas fantas fancifully in Leone's work and more violently in yours. Um, mm -hmm. um yeah, I was gonna say actually, it this passage I think it kind of um sum up, sums up what I was really what actually drove me to this idea that what would you know would there be sex if we didn't have private parts, for instance, you know? Um, and it made me, it, it was one of the things like with the circumcision, with this idea of, uh, you know, um, the society's fascination with uh, virg virginity, this, no, this constant observation of the women body, and in some instance also of um, the male body, you know, the size of your penis of, you know, and so there's a lot of language, there's a lot of expectation, there's a lot of um, uh, a prescriptive idea of what actually sex is before you're born. So you come, you're born and you fall into this idea and you're supposed, you know, and you, you are supposed to kind of enact that idea of love, of sex, of existence, you know? And, and to me, um, you know, I was really interested in how we can move this language, this conversation, this obsession with women body in particular in our society, in most societies, I guess. Um, and then, you know, and, and yeah, and for Saba, um, you know, she comes to a refugee camp, she's been this incredibly talented uh, person who comes to a refugee camp and then the society's gaze is on her. You know, so they're kind of watching, it's this constant observation, constant, um, you know, um, um, yeah, ob constant, uh, they're watching her constantly to just see when she would be a woman, you know, and it, it's like the erasure of privacy, the, the whole idea of existence, you know, her existence, there's no privacy, there's no individual moment in her life, it all becomes about you know, the rest of the society is watching her and seeing how she evolves into a woman, you know? And yeah, to me, that was kind of the most um, emotional scene in the book to write. Uh, and I guess I was in a different planet when I was writing the whole book, to be honest. Um, but, you know, coming out of it, I've just like, I wanted to see if it's possible to create an alternative world through art where actually, um, you know, body parts or the private parts don't play a role in how we define sex. And it just becomes one of the possibilities, not the main thing of how we define our existence when it comes to sex. I mean, I love that idea because there are so many interconnections of ideas here, I think, between our common works. Because while I wasn't putting um, genitalia aside, in fact, I'm bringing all of the women face to face with their own genitalia. There's still the question of, will I keep it? You know, now that it's fallen away from me and I have it in my hands, what will I do with it? Do I value it? Do I need it? Will I give it away? You know, there are characters who mix up their, their, their vulvas. Um, there, there are people who lose them. There are people who throw them away because they don't want them anymore. And they actually, when faced with the choice, don't choose to have them. There are others who one of the characters just plays around with it for a little while, laughs with her partner because she's happy and together they put it back. So I think, that, yes, this idea that we can get more expansive about how we can get so limited in our consideration of genitalia as being the be all and end all of sexual experience, but also the potentials, potential for being expansive. Because yes, I can't believe that as a human society, we've also decided that what our genitalia looks like or whether bits are intact or not intact has become so profoundly important to so many of us. Um, you know, the fact that, I mean, the hymen, is the hymen not the biggest lie in the world? I mean, the idea that, 
you know, every woman appears to be socialized with this weird idea that you are not a virgin, you are a virgin, you have an intact hymen, a man is so heteronormative as well, a man will come along and pierce this hymen and break it, you will bleed and be in lots of pain, and then somehow you will have had, you will be a grown up. This reductive ridiculousness, not to mention the fact that so many women have broken their hymens, if indeed they ever did have a hymen that didn't have a hole in it, because they've all got, they're all, I've done this research, they're all different shapes and sizes and there are holes in them. And this idea, but I don't know about you, Nadja, but I was like socialized into believing there was this kind of curtain of flesh that someone was going to pierce open and then I would be a woman. And it's ridiculous. It's actually not physiologically true i mean I, so Liman, I, this is something you write beautifully about as well yeah so and i was just saying you write beautifully about exactly this in, in your no book. no because as, as a child i remember like i went to a wedding and once i you know i saw this um group of people standing outside a window and and it, you know including the best man and you know and so I was told, like, so I asked, what well, what's going on here? So I was told, like, the best man was basically wait, waiting for a handkerchief to come through the window, you know, solid in the woman's blood. And and to me, it just kind of stayed with me. And it just, like... How did you uh, feel as a man seeing that and experiencing that? Sorry? How did you feel, Solomon, as a man looking I was, at that? I was, a, I was a child, and and that's oh. what. I, yeah, 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 I was a child. I was like <laughs> eight, nine, I and it stayed with me. I mean, that's the kind of, um, you know, uh, experiences that I have seen that kind of made me uh, question this notion of our obsession with virginity. You know, and, and that's why I write in a book, virginity, you are a virgin with each and every lover that you have, you know. And so, um, yeah, those are the kind of uh, things that I have watched, is, you know, when I was young that kind of stayed with me. And in a way, they power uh, part of my art as well. I'm going to take a moment because we're almost at the end to read a passage from um, Silence is My Mother Tongue in an act of ventriloquism that's fitting for this book in which um, a lot of ventriloquism happens, but um, I'm reading, yeah. Can I, yeah, I'm gonna show you a piece of art after or before, oh. maybe, maybe after, okay. I'll show you after, go, go for it, yeah, thank you. Beautiful. I still recall that summer evening inside Cin Cinema Silencio when a naked Baba crouched on my face. My eyes traveled along the long back of this woman I had loved since the first night in the camp. Above her arched neck, the stars glimmered around the moon. The call to the last prayer of the day was being announced via the plastic megaphone. Saba rearranged herself, spreading her map of love over me. This is our time, she said. This is my time. I wanted to speak, but I was breathless. Saba caressed my face as I inhaled the scent of her, the scent of her history, the battles she had won and lost, her rage, her frustrated dreams, the violence on her thighs, the rivers of desire inside her womb. She let go. She filled my mouth from her rivers, so warm that as it slid inside me through my throat, I felt riches invading me, gushing towards my soul, the white Nile and its water running between my ribs. The strings of the singer's cry played a mournful song nearby. The forest whistled. That impious breeze of the summer wafted against my cheeks, like a famished soul, I tried to grasp the warm air, my hands fluttering at my sides. Saba pushed down her weight, screwing the lock of my existence to her being even more. North and south finally reunited, Saba erasing the boundaries that have separated us for so long. Oh, thank you. I I'm glad you read it. Thank you so much. Um, Why no did... Why did you ask her to read it and you didn't read it? I have to know this. It's a great question. <laughs> it's a good question. I think, um, first of all, I when I wrote this book, it took me 10 years to write it. And I wrote it with such intensity and passion that I can't master 
the same passion and energy and intensity when I read it. I tried at the beginning when it was first out, I tried to read and then I told myself, I'm going to be silent. I'm just not going to read because I knew what it took out of me when I was writing it. Um, and I, when I was reading it out loud, it's just, I didn't feel the same. And I think this is why I tell people when I was writing this book, I was unconscious, you know, and, and it's, and, and it just felt like I was on a parallel universe. And, you know, and also I did, I don't think this book is, you know, this idea like um, people say you have to read because they want to hear the voice, the, the author's voice. I just feel like I was voiceless when I was writing this book. You know, my characters were the one who had the voice, who had the voice. And it just feels to me, you know, um, I think I wrote it and sometimes I feel like people who read my book, I just want to hear them. And maybe it's an egotistical thing. I just, I don't know. Maybe it's just the passion I have also for readers once I come out from that writing experience and seeing how how they, how they can read my own text and it feels nice. Um, yeah, mainly because of that. But I wanted to, to, to set the scene. It took me a long time to write that scene um, because it wasn't, it, you know, I, I kind of had to find the right way to write it, you know? And, you know, and for me, uh, finally, I managed it when I've discovered the work of the um, Japanese painter Na um, Namio Harukawa. I don't know if you know him. Uh, he was um, a painter, and I'm going to show you some work. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes, you can. Smoking lady, yes, <laughs> in, yeah. in many different ways. <laughs> yeah, and there's, there's the man underneath. So um, it just felt like um, it was, for me, it kind of, you know, I, he's not a famous, a well-known artist. And I think one of those artists who kind of, um, because he does engage with what the society calls fetish, you know? And I think this is, and I always felt like the reason we have such terms as fetish is because our definition of sex is so limited that anything that steps outside that, then we have a kind of generic term that we call the fetish, you know, uh, the thing. And, and so for me, those are kind of artists from the margin, artists who deals with those kind of, um, uh, you know, um, who are obsessed with those kind of themes are really important to me because they do show me like, you have to have a certain courage and certain boldness to kind of go out there and do your art uh, in the way you imagined it to be, not in the way the society expects you to do it. Oh, that's really beautiful. Both of you, both of you teach writing in various capacities. And I wonder how you talk to your students about writing about desire or how you would talk to a student about writing about desire and sexuality, were they to ask you for advice on how to do so? I think one of the first things I do, I've taught very particular courses on how to write erotica and how to write sex scenes and love scenes. And I think one of the first things I say, even though it may sound very simple, is that the work that needs to be done, at least in part, in every writer, is, is not work I can do with them or I can do in this workshop. Their own authentic considerations of body and sexuality and the kind of language they choose to use or not to use is actually a conversation that they have to have with themselves, which is associated with the way that they were brought up and their own, you know, complicated feelings about sexuality. Because on one level, writing about sex to me is just like writing about anything else, like writing about opera, like writing about bananas, like writing about dogs walking down the road. The, the question is always going to be, how do you find the right words? Um, and, and specificity and detail are always going to be your force, your power on, in, on, on, in the sentence. And so if one is going to, if that's true, and one is going to be specific and detailed about sexuality and about the, that particular movement of the body, then you need to have a conversation with yourself about what am I afraid of? 
what um what am I nervous about? What things am I afraid my mother's going to read? So therefore, I'm not going to put that down. How can I be as authentic in the writing of sex as I would be about any other thing I'm going to write about? And that's work. So actually, I start off by going, I can't help you. The work has to be done by you. And then, of course, I set them exercises to do. But it all goes back to specificity and detail. I um I, I really agree with that. I think it's um I think for me anyway, um uh when I when I started writing this book, for example, the first two years, I found it really difficult to to write the erotic scene, the sex scene, because I felt like I was conditioned. I felt I was I myself I was judgmental of my characters. And I think I had to rewrite myself. I had to kind of um, you know, um, destroy all this notion of taboo, all this notion of judgment that existed on my mind. And I think that for me, and, you know, it was some of the, you know, the most important aspect of a writer is not necessarily, you know, what you write, it's how you rewrite your imagination. I think that's really important, you know, and for me, art really helped me uh, not just reading, but also watching films and things like that to kind of, you know, um, to confront myself with the whole notion of taboo and how to come to, the, you know, to pull myself back to that primitive sense where we, uh, where my imagination is just this kind of wild place where, you know, where I had no sense of what is right or wrong. I just wanted to kind of go back to that sense and I managed it after two years of trying and failing. Uh, and so, yes, and I think, and that's why I always say, like I wrote this book, but this book rewrote me as well. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's the power of in being a, a writer or a, an artist. I think it's that ability you must have to confront the possibility that, you know, writing isn't just the output, but how you rewrite the whole notion of your imagination. I love that. And I really agree with that. I always feel like a novel, you know, short stories have all kinds of possibilities. It's true. But I feel like the novel, if you get to the end of a novel and something in you has not grown or changed yeah. or broken or being put back together again or just looked at, you know, and you go, wow, OK, in, in the still of this night, I see myself and I must find the words for that self. And that self may be not the one that you expected. And I just, I feel like that's a gift that, that the novel gives us potentially. You're, you're right, I, I, well, I, so, I so agree with you. The opportunity but also to- Also a, no, a novel can give you the, um, the gift of doubt, I think. Also the gifts of destroying whatever comfort thing you had. You know, I'm, I'm yes. saying that because I just finished my third novel or last year I finished it. And it took me weeks to finish it. And after I finished it, I felt like completely fragmented. You know, to this day, I feel like I don't know which part of me I'm sitting here talking to you or which part I have lost or gained. You know, it's just this, this idea as a writer for me that you just have to be susceptible to change constantly. And you don't know what you discover. And I think that's part of the thrill for me anyway of writing isn't the outcome is in selling books, is in this, but also the, the process of writing itself is so, it could be so tortuous. It could be so, uh, it could, yeah, make you rediscover ideas, about, be it about love, be it about sex, be it about how you engage with other people, with other fellow writers, with yourself as well. So it's very, very kind of, yeah. I have no words for it, but <laughs> I so I so recognize the expression on your face, Sulema. And I yeah, so recognize it. Wonderful. When you come out of a book and you feel crazy and yeah. astonishing and astonished. And yes, there's there's nothing else quite like it. And you're never except quite except for maybe except for maybe sex. I mean, as you were speaking, yes, Suleiman, yes, I was like, maybe that sounds yeah. a little bit like sex as well, where like you yeah don't know what will happen some part of you is lost some part of you is gained you feel fragmented and put back together again i think it's, it's a really beautiful note for us to end on because i wish we could keep talking forever and i also wish i could open this up to audience questions but cannot do either of those things and so instead must just thank you both so much for your time and for thank this you talk so much.
Um, Thank you. And to remind our viewers that you can order these beautiful books, which you absolutely want to order um, in the link below. And to please consider making a donation to the Brooklyn Book Festival, which is celebrating its 16th year of presenting free literary programming. Um, thank you so much, both of you, for joining us and to everyone who is watching. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. <laughs>